before I start, I'm going to help us all with a little bit of maturity level. And you think, what? Because as a pastor, it's pretty obvious to me that all of us, including myself, that uh, we need help as far as being a little bit more mature. And by that, I mean this. You know, it's pretty, uh, the cancel culture has just swept through the world. But unfortunately, it's swept into the church as well. Have I got your attention? You know, I'm just amazed. I've been doing this for over 30 years, not pastoring, but I've been in full-time ministry over 30 years. And I'm, it's just amazing that in the 30 years, it seems and it appears that uh, when a minister says something that people disagree with, they cancel him, cancel, they quit the church. That's been going on way before this culture, cancel culture has been started. You know, I have said some things. If you ever take notes and listen, this would be a good message to make sure you listen and take notes. Just saying. I was praying this week. Man, the Lord just, I was walking probably about two or three miles in this church, and the Lord started speaking to me about today. So I changed my whole message for this. That doesn't happen every week. But it happened this week. There's been things that I've said years ago that I don't even agree with now. And guess what? I didn't quit the church. I thought that would bring a lot more laughs than what it did. But anyway, <laughs> I've disagreed with myself. And, I, you know, because people, when they disagree with me, they, they usually quit the church or if something's done or somebody's offended, they quit the church. Did you know that is so ungodly? Amen. Now, it'd be different. Don't, let me just be blunt about this. If I get up and say Jesus is no longer the way, then everybody will quit, should quit the church. My wife will quit the church. You can rest assured. But I mean, if there's peripheral things that you disagree with, come on. We got to be more mature than that. Jesus, he showed this as our example. He did. He didn't cancel people. When Peter and John were those guys, they said, hey, somebody's over there. They're not following us, but they're, they're preaching the other things, you know. And you want us to call fire down on them? Jesus goes, man, you don't know what spirit you are. If they're preaching Jesus, they're with us. They're for us. So every church on this planet that is preaching Jesus, they're for us and with us. So we just got to... The reason I'm prefacing this, because I'm pretty sure there's going to be people who are watching online... Probably a handful of people in here even that will disagree with some of the things that I say today. I'm going to give my opinion on some things, which means that's what it is, my opinion, which means you can disagree with that. But don't cancel me out because or the church out because of that. Dear Lord, let's get some maturity. It's just time for the church just to mature just a little bit, at least a half a step. Amen? Amen. And there's going to be some things that uh, may sound ungrace-like. <laughs> and I was talking about this in the Lord. I mean, I just felt like the Lord says you can read in the New Testament. There's some things that I said and Paul said that were very ungrace-like. Jesus and Paul, man, sometimes he just, spiritually speaking, he slapped the people upside the head. Talking about the Corinthians, man, I mean, he just... Jesus, sometimes he just spoke some things you just went, wow. So some of the things I'm going to say today are, wow. You know how they do in movies? Before this movie, it may be some profanity, even some of this and some of this. So I'm just prefacing this. I just know that um, we need to give people more grace than what we have been giving them. Did you know in Luke 6.38, it's a very popular scripture that a lot of ministers uh, 
pull up when it's offering time. Give and it shall be given to you. Press down, shaking together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. I don't disagree with that. But you need to read verse 37. It's not part of the scriptures. I'm just bringing it up right here. 37 says this, that it, be careful how you judge. Because with how you judge people is going to be measured back to you the same way. Yeah, that scripture is not so popular when you, when you put it that way. Make sure you forgive. Make sure you're careful to judge people. Man, if there's ever a time in history, this should be a refrigerator scripture, let me tell you. Because I know, you know, a couple of years ago, there was an awakening about racial justice, and I thought that was good and everything, but I am amazed that the woke culture that the cancel culture has taken this to such an extreme that now there's more division in our nation than probably since the Civil War. It's absolutely... But this is what I know. It's not about race, and it's not about gender. It's about getting God out of everything. I had my, I just thought, this is all about trying to get God. I mean, it's not good enough to get God out of our schools. It's not good enough to get prayer out of schools. It's not good enough to get prayer out of this nation. Their ultimate, the liberal media is wanting to cancel God. Lawlessness. I just know this, the, the direction that, our leadership, not only in this nation, but around the world, they're taking us down a destination that the bridge is out. That's my opinion. It's my opinion that we do need a leadership change, and that will cause things to be better, but I'm saying this to you who are putting all your trust in the government. That's not going to fix it. The church has relied, and people in this nation have relied upon the government to fix everything, and that is not the fixer. We left God out of the picture, and he's the only one. You know, I heard um, Billy Graham's son. What's his name? Franklin. Franklin uh, I was going to say Franklin Roosevelt. But anyway, Franklin Graham. He said the only thing that this is going to help this nation and the world is God. And man, that sounds so simple, but it's so true. And I want to give us and people who are watching a, just a, a little awakening, a, just a little shakening. We need to be, sh because of this, you know what concerns me more than anything? Our kids and our grandkids and great-grandkids. Because they're going to be raised in a culture that we've never even experienced before. I'm 62 years old, and this is the worst this world has been in my 62 years. It's the worst as I would have never dreamed 30, 40 years ago of living in a nation where I live today. Where it's, you better be watching what's taught at your schools for your kids. We didn't have that problem when I was growing up. Why? Because we were taught math, science, literature, and basic principles of learning. Today, holy cow, they're not teaching. You better be careful what they're teaching your kids. And then in some school districts, they take away the power of the parent and say the teacher knows best. Are you kidding me? Mm. So many terrible things that are going on in this plan. Now, listen, I'm going to give you the good, the bad, and the ugly. Right now, this is the bad and the ugly, all right? So just hold on. Are you hearing me? Listen to it. Even if you're disagreeing with me, even if you think, oh, I don't think this world... Is that bad off? I think there's some good things. There's some good things. But, honey, if you think you're deceived, that's what I'm going to say. You're deceived. But if you hang on to the end, you'll be shouting. All right? So can you just give me some grace here? I am concerned. And this is why I think that parents that have young kids... 
grandparents that have grandkids or great-grandkids. We can't just be nonchalant about what's going on in the planet. If there's ever a time for you as a parent to make sure God is the center of your life, it's today. You bet. I know kids, when they grow up, they have a free choice. You can raise your kid to the best of your knowledge, raise them in church, raise them with godly principles, and then they still have a choice no matter what. That's just the way God set it up, and, and I'm thankful he did that because we all have a choice, and he will even let you choose destruction. He will. He said, I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. But he's saying you have a choice. But my, my concern is this, that the atmosphere that our children are being raised up in, it's going to be difficult for them to make right choices. I, I, I just was meditating. Lord, how, how did we get here as a nation? How did we get here? I think there's many reasons, and I'm not going to try to explain all of them, but I do know one thing. We've been more prosperous right now than than any time in the history of the United States. We have. Now, I know some of you may be struggling financially and everything else, but generally speaking, I mean, it's it's very prosperous time in this, in this nation. Now, granted, it's getting worse because I filled up my truck and I think it cost me $120 and then the gas pump turned off. And I went, oh man, that's kind of ironic that it was 120 even. And it said, you hit your limit. And I went, holy cow, I didn't even fill up my truck. So, yeah, it's a little bit expensive, and inflation's going. So, I mean, like I said, there's a lot of things going on economically, socially, morality, that this nation is just jumping into the pit. And I'm believing, like uh, they say, that Roe versus Wade may be overturned. I pray that it does. But this is the thing. Listen to me, church. I think that's a great thing. But the bottom line is this, that people who don't believe the Bible, who don't put their faith in God, nothing's going to change for them. So it's your job and my job to try to pray for them and show them, not hate them, but to show them that Psalms 139 and Jeremiah 1 talks about how God did form you in the womb and he was the one creating you in the womb and he has a plan and purpose before you were even born. So it's vitally important that we don't abort babies. But having said that, we can't just have legislation in place to make sure, okay, everything's good now. No, it's not. That's not going to fix it. It's our job and your job to get people to see the truth. I understand why people get aborted. If you don't, th- if you just think that's just, I don't know what they think. You know, a fetus is just something inside of a woman. Then yeah, I, they can go to sleep tonight. If not, wor- be concerned about abortion. But if they have a revelation light that the Word of God says. That's God creating me inside of me. That God had a plan for me before I was even conceived. And then once I was conceived, he started knitting. God knits things together inside of you and me. For you and me, I should say. But we have to believe that. The part in Deuteronomy chapter 8, I'm not going to read all of it. It's 10 through 18. I've gave them that scripture. It says... When you have eaten and you are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Man, God bless America. He has. I'm telling you, he has blessed this nation. But then he says, and he gives a warning, which I believe we have not taken heed to. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, his statutes, which I command you today, lest you have eaten and are full and you've built beautiful houses, you dwell with them, you have flocks, you have all of this stuff, 
and you just forget God. I think that's where we are at. We have forgotten God. We have. And because of that, this is the thing. We in America have this mentality that we can get along fine in life without God because we have food on the table, we have a place to live, we have something to drive, we have good jobs. And so in reality, we don't really need God. And you can just, there's some religious people who fill the religious square every Sunday, but then they just do that on Sunday, and then the rest of their life, there's been really no sense of God in their thought life or in their prayer. They don't pray, they don't read. You say, well, Mike, it sounds like you're doing, saying that it's all performance. No, God loves people if they never pray or never read. But this is the problem. If you don't have a relationship with God, you will. It's kind of like, you know, if you have friends that just kind of draw, float away, and how did that happen? You don't make an effort to talk to them, to spend time with them, and then, well, I wonder what old Joe's doing. I haven't talked to him in years. There's Christian people that have that same mentality. I wonder what's up with God. I haven't talked to him in years. (laughs) I'm not here to condemn you. I'm just here to wake us all up. I believe there needs to be, I believe there's a, an awakening happening on this planet. And so I'm going to eventually get to the shouting ground, so just hang on. I know all of you are thinking, I knew I should have stayed home. <laughs> it was cold and I had a warm bed. We have to cooperate with God. We have to cooperate with His Word. We do. We have to cooperate with His Word. It doesn't happen automatically. The promises are yes and amen, but they're not manifested automatically. I'm pretty sure you understand that. The blessings of the Lord are yes and amen, but that doesn't mean they're going to happen in your life. Healing has already been provided for, but that doesn't mean it's going to be manifested in your life. You've been made the head and not the tail. Whatever you put your hand to shall surely prosper. But that doesn't mean all of those things are going to happen in your life. There has to be some cooperation with the Word of God and having a relationship with Him so faith can be manifested outside of you. Faith is in each and every one of us, but it has to be manifested. Healing is inside of us, but it has to be manifested. Prosperity is inside of us, but it has to be manifested. Or you just think, man, the Word of God doesn't work. It works absolutely just like gravity does. It works. But this is what I believe. I believe I see Christians panicking because of what's going on on the planet. Now, this is where the rubber's going to meet the road. We believe the negativity that's happened in the United States is greater than the power of God that is inside each and every one of us. Mm. We quote this scripture. I've heard it the majority part of my life. Greater is he that is in me than He that is in the world. What does that mean? What does that mean? You can study that in Greek. You can study that in Arabic. You can study that in Hebrew. You can study that in Swahili and any other language you want. It means that the the greatness and goodness of God is greater than anything on this planet, greater than anything in the United States of America, greater than anything in Washington, D.C., in the capital greater than anything in the mayor's house, in the, the, the governor's house. What is in us is greater than anything that they can choose for this nation. Amen. But the majority of Christians don't believe that. I took dancing lessons, so I, I, I think I, I can do that. But anyway. We'll get you cue cards next week on a scale of eight. Eight to ten, you know, or one to ten, you know, 
Hold up an ape if you think I did a good dance move. But anyway, I don't believe the church believes that. I believe that we as a church, not Rocky Mountain Family Church, but as a whole, because what I, I sense as an atmosphere is that the church is scared of everything that's going on and actually fear everything that's going on. <laughs> Psalms 91, a popular psalm. I just read it this morning. Again, you know, it's, we won't be, he says, do not be fearful of the pestilence. And people are scared. I mean, you know, like there's another wave of the coronavirus. There's another sickness. And monkeypox, I think, is that the new thing? Monkeypox. People have been acting like monkeys for a long time, and they don't need that. But anyway, I mean, monkeypox, so it's another fear, and everybody's really concerned. And, and so as a believer, where is our foundation? Are you really going to believe what Psalms 91 says, that no pestilence shall come near to my house for the arrow that flies by day? In other words, there could be war breaking out. I'm going to be at peace in my home. Russia can push the button. And I'm going to sleep well at night. Well, what are you going to believe? There is a foundational principle that the church has to get back to, and that is the Word of God. Do we really believe what it says? Are we so fearful that somebody can make a decision in the White House that will totally annihilate the United States of America? I'm going to give you a story this morning. We're to the good and happy part now. (laughs) There's a story. It's very familiar. You think it's just about healing. But hopefully I'll shed some other light on Mark chapter 5. It's a lot of scripture. Are you ready? Let's start at verse 21. Now, when Jesus had crossed over and get again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. When he saw him, he fell at his feet. He begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him. A great multitude followed him and thronged him. So, I mean, it's crowd. There is a crowd. You get the picture? Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. She suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately. The fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around to the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? The disciples said, You see the multitude thronging you? You know, in modern day language, are you crazy? Are you, are, are you kidding me? Are you serious? You see the multitude thronging you? You say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing, trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house and said, Your daughter's dead. Don't trouble the teacher any further. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. Permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue. He saw the tumult of those who wept, wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. Listen to what he said. The child is not dead, but sleeping. They ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and it entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand. He said to her, Talitha kumi, which is translated little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl, the girl arose and walked 
she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. Jesus was on his way to help a young... Listen to me. Everybody awake? Jesus was on his way to help a younger generation. And somebody in the older generation stopped him. Because they needed healing. This older generation, a woman was bleeding... Obviously, she was bleeding from a place that she should be given birth. Listen to me now. The older generation should have been given birth, but there was no birth happening because it was just bleeding. There was something not right. There was no fruit being produced. I believe this could be a picture of the church not producing fruit like we should just because listen to him just because we don't know who we are just because we don't know there's greatness and goodness and the miracle working power on the inside of us so we just go whatever the world takes us or whatever decisions or whatever choices we really don't believe in the miracle power of God Not giving up on that generation, Jesus, by faith, that woman realized that she tried to get help from the doctors, from everything, but grew worse, spent all that she had. So she knew that the only thing that would help her is Jesus. The only thing that's going to help the church and this nation and this world is Jesus. And I believe there's people rising up and being awakened to that, to just like the woman who reached out and touched the hem of his garment, healing took place. Now, for those who believe that the younger generation is going to hell in a handbasket, for those who believe that the younger generation is dead, Jesus, what it looked like was a hiccup, went and said that the girl is just sleeping. This younger generation just needs to be waking up. And they laughed. And they scorned and said, no, she's dead. Are you kidding? They went from wailing to laughing to scorn to ridiculing, making fun of the master because... They were saying, no, this younger generation's dead. No hope. Jesus said, get everybody out. (laughs) And he says, she's just asleep. She just needs to be woke. The younger generation is trying to bring up this culture of wokeness. And they don't really realize what they really need to be woke to is Jesus. But in all of the apathy and all of the sin and lawlessness and all of this stupidity and all of this garbage going on, God says, everything's going to be all right. (laughs) Because I'm going to woke this generation. I'm going to woke them. So, I believe that God is not giving up on America, not giving up on the world, not giving up on the younger generation. It's just time you and I start believing the Word of God and believe that truly greater is He that is in us. You know, David said this. I'm going to skip down. Psalms 27, 13. Listen to this. Psalms 27, 13. This is the New Living Testament. Okay, I'll read it. Listen to me. All right. Yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness when I get to heaven. No, he says, I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness while I'm here 
in the land of the living. In the land of the living. Uh, Pull up the message translation of verse 14. I'm sure now I'll see God's goodness in the exuberant earth. Stay with God. Verse 14. Take heart. Don't quit. I'll say it again. Stay with God. Now, this is the part where you and I need to cooperate. He said, I'm confident that I will see the goodness of God in Pueblo, Colorado. I'm confident I'm going to see it right here. I don't care what our government says. I don't care what our school district says. I don't care what anybody says about our city. I am confident that I will see the goodness of God in our city. You just need to give voice and faith to that. But most of people in Pueblo have been the 20-something years I've lived here, they talk about the badness of Pueblo, and they talk about how terrible things are, and they talk about, well, this is just the way things are. And guess what? That's just the way things have been. But I believe the goodness of God is going to be manifested in my city because God is in this place. We just need to be woken up to that. I believe there's going to be manufacturing jobs. I believe there's going to be businesses started. I believe prosperity is going to be so awesome in this city. People are going to want to live in Pueblo, Colorado. Stay with God. That's our part. Mamas, daddies, make God the center of your life. If nothing else, for the sake of your kids. Make God the center of your life. Don't just make him Sunday morning. Make God the center of your life. What does that look like? I'm not going to try to tell you that. That's up because then it'll be a performance thing. But I am telling you this. Make God the center of your life. And I believe this. I've been believing for God to have miracles in our sanctuary, in this church, in your life. When you get home, not just in while you're in church, I believe people are going to be, receive miracles. And the Lord just says, why don't you believe that for every church in your city? I was walking along and I just thought that. I said, well, Lord, there's some people that, that preach in their pulpit that they don't even believe miracles. He says, do you think that's too, too much for me to do? <laughs> yeah, it's too big for God if... You know, if they don't believe in miracles, God can't do miracles. What? God says, if you believe that, more you could believe that the Baptists, the Methodists, the Presbyterian, the full gospel, any church you want to name, I can show up and do miracles. I just need somebody to believe that. So as a church, let's just believe every church, every church in this city, it's going to have, do you think that would change our nation or our city? Do you think it would change the atmosphere of church, of religion in this city? I guarantee you the newspapers couldn't, wouldn't be able to do, just sweep that under the rug. The government of the city couldn't sweep it under the rug if there was miracles happening every time church doors were opened up. We may have a few more people sitting in the pew. Believe that. I would have fainted. One translation says, David said, I would have fainted. I would have fainted. I think the King James Version says, I would have fainted. In other words, given up if I would not have believed that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. There's people giving, there's churches, there's people, there's Christians that are giving up. And part of it is because they've lost all hope. There's Christians that have lost all hope for the nation. There's Christians that have just given up. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. We have to start getting our minds renewed, ladies and gentlemen. We have to start getting our minds renewed to the fact that God is wanting to do goodness in your life, in your church, in your city. He just needs you and me to cooperate with him. Believe it. Instead of believing all the negative stuff that's happening, 
on the news, turn it off and believe that, you know what, they're saying this is going to happen. They're saying there's going to be, they're saying that, you know, and I even hear preachers, there's going to be a, a food shortage. And I'm telling you, it's going to be in, worldwide, there's going to be a food shortage and, and people are going to go hungry and everything. And so preachers are preaching in that and bless their little heart. The gospel is not about fear. Every farmer can have a drought in every place on this planet. Every grocery store can be locked up. But as for me and my house, we're going to believe there will be food on my table no matter what comes. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not into your own understanding unless there's a food shortage. Unless gas goes up to $10 a gallon. And then we're finished. We're done. Take me home, Lord Jesus. That's funny, but that's what the church believes. We're dependent upon the price of gas. We're dependent upon if Walmart's shelves are stopped. We're dependent upon that. Renew your mind and be dependent upon God. Because there may be a day where it could be life or death for you. But the goodness of God wants to be manifested. It wants to be manifested. You know, the devil's still doing the same thing that he did to Adam and Eve. He's using the same tactic. I'm going to close with this. Causing them to believe that life could be better without what God said. Life could be better. I know God said that, but he really didn't mean that. If you listen to what I'm saying, and life can be a lot better. Church people have believed that. We believe what the world has told us. I'm telling you, let's be woke up this morning. <laughs> let's awaken to what God has said about us. I believe our best days are ahead of us. I just believe God's up and handed up in heaven with his arms folded and has said, come on now. Everybody down on earth is going, come on, God, come on, God. And God's going, come on, come on. He's waiting for you and me. He's waiting for you and me to be woke up, to be awakened to what's inside of us, to be awakened to the goodness of God, to be awakened that the anointing abides in you. It just doesn't abide on the ministry. It abides in everyone who's a believer. The anointing of God. It destroys yokes. It is the power of God. And it's waiting to be manifested on the outside. But it's in you. We just need to be woke up to it. Just like the little girl. Jesus said she's not dead. She's sleeping. I believe we were waking up and we're going to see the power of God light's going to be extremely bright darkness is going to be extremely dark just seems like it's being that way but the great thing about light and darkness is this darkness has no power over light I don't care how black a room is I mean, I've been in Mammoth Cave in, in Kentucky where they shut all the lights off. And she said, put your hand in front of your face. And I did. And you could not see anything. It gave me the ibijibis. I mean, I mean, just like, Melody's there. Okay, good, good. Stay right here. You couldn't see anything. And then she turned the lighter on, a big lighter. The darkness was not so powerful that it could not make that light go away. Listen to me, this is so simple, but it needs to be a re revelation. No matter how dark it gets in this planet, I don't care. It cannot overtake the lightness. When, this, when we turn the lights on in the morning, you know, it's filled with darkness, you know, and you turn the lights on, darkness just doesn't just go to the corner and go, well, I'm not leaving this spot. I'm not going to leave this spot. It, it, it doesn't have the power to do that. No matter, it doesn't just say, well, I'm so dark, you can't make me leave the corner. When I turn the lights on, boom, every corner is lit up. Darkness leaves. 
I said darkness leaves. I said darkness leaves. So don't try to just take authority over the darkness. Let the light of God shine out of you. There will be no problem darkness leaving. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Hopefully you received that on a good note. Just don't let any fear. Don't let what the world's saying. We just need for the truth, the gospel, to be exposed to people who are in darkness. When they receive the light and it shines on them, good things will happen to them. I believe this. Because if Roe versus Wade is overturned, there's still going to be abortions. So what's the clue? What's the, what's the key? Get people's hearts changed. If every woman and man on this planet believe that that is a living person on the inside of them, they have a revelation of that, I don't care what legality they say next. You know, doesn't won't matter. Every abortion clinic in America will be closed because of no service. Because of no service. Why? Because everybody understands. Everybody has a revelation. That's good news. Let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray in the name of Jesus that we would be woke. <laughs> we would wake up, arise, shine, for the light has come. Arise, shine, for the truth is in you. The kingdom of God has already come. Jesus said the kingdom of God is coming. It's near unto you, but it's here now, and it's in us. May we all have an understanding. Our eyes be opened up. May we all have the hope that is in us, that we would not be like the world without hope, but we would shout it from the mountaintop, the good news, the gospel. Thank you for giving us grace to do that. Thank you for having mercy, even in our weakness. We lean, we trust, we rely upon you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. On my left and on your right, these people will pray for you if you need prayer in any area of your life. Listen to me. Take this message and just think about it. I think it's a powerful message. I think it's a message that the world needs to hear. I do. Not just because I said it, because I believe it came from God. I believe the church needs to be woke up. And that's you and me, myself included. Amen. We're going to receive our offering now. This is ways to give. You can give cash. There's envelopes in the back of the chair. I proclaim that this year we're going to pay the building off. I've said that for about, I don't know, 10 years. But we are closer than that. We only owe about 80 something thousand dollars. You believe that? Only 80 something thousand dollars. I mean, that's nothing. But anyway, we can't buy a shed in Pueblo now for 80,000 almost. But anyway, we're going to pay it off. You can text the amount to 84321. If you want to go online, rmfchurch.org, click on give. If you ever mail a check, mail it to P.O. Box 8023-81008. I believe, did I cover everything? All right, let's say these scriptures together. Ready? Say it like you mean it. Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. Let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of the Davises. I truly love you. I spoke from my heart this morning. I really did. And I'm believing for hearts to be change for minds to be renewed and for you to be empowered to be empowered to be what God wants you to be in Jesus name amen God bless you